Hello and welcome to this short version of Autism and the Brain-Body Connection. Uh, this workshop is an hour-long workshop, but um, in the interest of individuals being able to view it uh, more readily, I've created this shorter version. And my name is Dr. Steve Tullius. I am a pediatric and family chiropractor. I lecture internationally on health and well-being, and specifically on chiropractic and pediatrics. This uh, information is about results. Um, we're seeing tremendous results in our office as well as other offices throughout the world. And uh, we want to share that with you so you can make the best decision when it comes to your child's health care. The nervous system um, processes, your brain processes 11 trillion bits of information every second. It's like a huge sponge just taking in information from the envi environment. And it does so, so through the spinal cord and, and all the nerve endings um, that come off of that uh, spinal cord. You know, the information in our environment doesn't change, but how we respond to and how we are able to interpret that information does. Um, and so that's what we're really going to talk about here. There, this is your nervous system, your brain, your spinal cord, and then all the nerves coming off your spinal cord and your, is housed and protected by your spinal column and your, your vertebrae. That's the main function of the, of the spinal uh, column there. This graphic represents how information comes into the brain and, and how a healthy response comes about. Um, on the left where we have our senses, all the information coming in through the various senses um, and then into the brain and then uh, there should be a healthy output, a healthy response, and a healthy adaptation to what's going on in the environment. And so in this equation, um, researchers are primarily looking at the brain as the problem. They're saying that you know, the autistic brain is different and, um, and that this is why the response is different. And while that is true to some degree, they're not looking at how, you know, is the information um, coming in properly? Is the brain able to respond to that information appropriately? This is how some, inf you know, an example of how information comes into the nervous system. It's a normal reflex. We've all had this done before at some point. Doctor hits your knee with a little hammer there. Information goes into your nervous system and your nervous system produces a response. And that's a way to look at how healthy is the nervous system. This is a diagram of the autonomic nervous system. And it's like the automatic system because it controls all the... Uh, activities of your body, your organs, your heart rate, blood pressure, digestion, all those things so that we don't have to think about it. This is a diagram looking at sensory integration. It basically happens in three steps. Information comes in through the sensory receptors, through the eyes, the ears, and, and especially your proprioceptive system. This is a system that uh, very few people really talk about. And it's made up of uh, nerve endings that um, relay information about the environment. Um, when you touch something, um, when you feel uh, textures, that sort of thing. Um, coordination is all controlled by this. So information comes in through these various areas, especially the spine. And that information goes up into the brainstem. It's processed and then goes over to the cerebellum where a lot of information is then distributed to other parts of the brain where, where the brain can um, uh, respond and, and act appropriately based on the information. So where is that disconnect happening? Is it happening purely with the brain itself? Um, or is it where that information is coming in? And um, you know, again, the answer is really both. And this term neuroplasticity really um, talks about how the brain um, is able to change based on the information coming in. So um, this book by Dr. Norman Doidich, he really explains this concept. Um, you know, they used to think that the brain was static, that if you had a brain injury, that whatever part of the brain that controlled that function, you know, that function would be lost. But what they found is that the brain will recruit other areas based on the information coming in. So, um, you know, if you have a... Um, Take, for instance, you know, learning to a new activity such as golf or riding a bike, learning to walk. You know, all this information comes in. It creates a pathway, and um, if that pathway changes, if you start, you know, just say you lost a leg and you start walking on one leg, that's going to alter the information going into the brain and, and change output as well. Um, neuroplasticity can be broken down like this. You have a thought, feeling, or action. Um, the cre that creates um, new neural structures and the repetition of that activity uh, strengthens those connections and, and creates new um, 
new pathways. So the brain we know can now it can rewire, readjust, and also learn things over again. Disaffrontation is, is a big word for an imbalance of sensory information going into the brain. So that information going in through the different sensory organs. Dis um, means you know not not right, you know, dysfunction. And affrontation is referring to that side of the nervous system with information goes up to the brain. So basically it represents an imbalance of that information. And that proprioceptive system has two sides. It has the the mechanoreceptors, which register uh, touch, pressure, um, uh, textures, that sort of thing. Um, they let the body know where it is um, in space so that your coordination is proper. Uh, nociceptors uh, register harmful stimuli such as touching a hot stove or other um, harmful situations. And disaffrontation is, is the process where there's decreased mechanoreception, which is good, healthy information, which actually helps feed the brain and, and lead to normal neurodevelopment, and an increase in nociception, which is actually harmful and causes um, this negative neuroplastic situation with, with negative pathways. It causes an increased stress response and also increased disease susceptibility and, and global effects other ways as well. So the quality of our lives depends upon that information we take in, but also on our ability to respond in a healthy manner. So you know, we're back to where's that disconnect. You know, it, it takes a village to to really help um, children that are having these sorts of challenges. I'm certainly not suggesting that chiropractic can cure auti autism or or it's the only thing that needs to be addressed. Um, you know, you need to have um, speech pathologists, occupational therapists, medical doctors all on your team. However, it is a piece of the puzzle that is not being addressed by society at large. And this study looked at how subluxation creates neuroplastic changes, uh, which are functional. Okay, functional meaning they're reversible, um, and it alters that information going into the brain. So, what is subluxation? A vertebral subluxation is a misalignment of a bone, basically in the spine, that impacts the nerve function. When there's a decrease in the range of motion of a uh, spinal joint, as this study shows, um, there's that it creates that disaffrontation process, which causes that uh, decrease in that good information going up and an increase of bad information going in, which creates central sensitization or a negative uh, neuroplastic um, process, creating um, bad pathways. And this study also supported that those findings, and, and again, it found that these, these changes, these pathological processes are functional, meaning they, they can be reversed. Dysponesis is a big word for basically errors in how your body uses energy. Um, it's a, a state where there's misdirected neurophysiological um, reactions as well. And um, this paper looked at how dyspanesis is, a, again, it's a reversible process. Um, the scan on the right there, that graphic is showing a segmental EMG scan, um, which we use in the office. It's looking at how the muscles of the spine, or the muscles along the spine are working or firing. And that graph there shows that there's quite a bit of imbalance. Um, the red indicates high level of stress. And it, it's just, there's not a lot of balance, and it, and it should be balanced uh, along the spine there. This autonomia is, is a... Um, malfunction of the autonomic system, that automatic system that controls all of our function. And so subluxation causes this process where um, there's uh, dysautonomia, where the that autonomic system is not working as well as it should. And we measure that through um, paraspinal thermography, looking at the skin temperature along the spine. We see on that uh, graphic on the right that that um, scan is extremely imbalanced. All the heat is coming off on the right side, and it's especially um, imbalance in the upper um, cervical spine there. And what we know is that the degree of asymmetry, the degree of imbalance, um, is a good indicator of the degree of dysfunction. And these, um, these temperature changes are associated with vertebral subluxation. Fight or flight is that uh, response of the nervous system, which is a healthy response when there's a um, something stressful, such as a tiger or um, you know, a, a dangerous situation. The, the nervous system kicks in and produces a um, increase in blood pressure, heart rate, all these things that would help us fight or, or run away. Um, the majority of that sympathetic nervous system is housed in the cervical spine, the, the neck here, 
And so it, it makes sense that when the when the there's a misalignment of vertebrae in this neck where all these nerves are coming out, that that would negatively impact the function of the nervous system. Just as if you um, decrease the amount of electricity going to your house, that would cause problems as well. And this study looked at the sympathetic nervous system and how adjusting the spine, restoring the range of motion of the spine, actually produce um, re re uh, relaxation in that um, nervous system, and that especially that fight or flight response um, area. So how common is subluxation? It's extremely common, which is why I recommend all children get checked at birth, um, whether you know whether they're having problems or not. I've checked my son since he was born. I continue to check him on a regular basis. Not, um, you know, if he's not out of alignment, he certainly wouldn't be adjusted. But I check him because just how vital the nervous system is to our overall health and function. And so this study found that in the first month of life, 80% of um, of that 1,000 infants that were checked were found to have vertebral misalignments in their upper neck. This study looking at 1,250 infants uh, found that in the first five days 90 percent had suffered birth trauma um, to the head um, and neck areas. And and this is really why we ha we're having um, more and more interventions and and you know between cesarean sections and um, rushed um, labors and deliveries. Um, the techniques in Western culture are, um, uh, they're just, they're not as natural and normal as they used to be. Um, but even th in the most natural and normal births, th that process ex is extremely um, uh, stressful on the spine and nervous system. And as this medical doctor points out, you know, those traumas frequently escape diagnosis. And it uh, makes sense because the in infants can't tell us, you know, if there's a problem. And typically these problems, um, you know, are manifested in things such as colic, uh, failure to thrive, um, uh, various, um, you know, other issues, ear infections, um, things like this, and, um, you know, trouble um, breastfeeding, these different things. And, um, you know, typically goes undiagnosed. So what causes subluxation? Basically, it's all caused by stress. Physical stress we just mentioned in, in the birth process, but also falls, um, you know, those sorts of things. Chemical stress in the mental stress. Chemical stress would be in the form of um, toxins in our environment, in the foods we eat, and um, other other ways that it could potentially enter our body. So here we are back at the where we started. We're here at the scan of, of a three-year-old um, diagnosed with autism. Initially came to my office um, with um, with the mother had um, complaints of um, you know just wasn't able to um, follow any sort of um, requests. He was uh, constantly flapping his hands. He had the you know that stimming behavior, um, outbursts, um, very little eye contact, and just a lot of rocking back and forth. Um, and so that sc scan, the first scan is below, and his second follow-up scan two months later is above. And it shows just a tremendous change in, in the uh, autonomic system balance there. So initial scan showed a high degree of uh, tension, stress, and then the follow-up scan shows mostly white and green there. And, you know, but how did that affect his quality of life? You know, this child went from um, only using one-word sentences to going to three to four words at a time, his eye movements and his uh, just ability to uh, engage others with eye contact improved dramatically. Um, his coordination, his behavior, the s a lot of the stimming behavior ceased, and and so um, you know the scan looks phenomenal, but but the the results, the quality of life improvement is, is what really matters. Um, and this is what we use also to track those quality of life um, improvements. It's the autism treatment evaluation checklist, which um, is filled out by parents on their first initial uh, visit or consultation and on uh, monthly follow-ups, um, which we also do the, the scans as well. And what it showed over um, over two-month period on average, um, individuals have had a 30-point drop in their ATEC scores which the lower scores the better and the biggest improvements have been in the areas of um, communication, language, um, sociability and behavior. So we're seeing some really great changes there. So now that you know this information, you know how how are you going to use it to Im improve the quality of 
your child's life or even the quality of your own. You know, I know families um, with a child who's diagnosed with autism are under extreme amounts of stress, you know, both the parents and the siblings. And, and so um, chiropractic is a way to help improve, you know, again, not to treat any of those conditions, even the autism, but to improve the function of the nervous system, which in turn improves the quality of life and often quite dramatically for children diagnosed with autism. You know, I, I hope that you'll give us a call um, to schedule an initial visit or, or if you'd like to speak with me personally on the phone um, to discuss your child's history and, and to see how chiropractic can improve their quality of life, I, I'd love to do so. If you live outside the area um, or outside of the state and uh, country, I have a wide network of chiropractors that um, deal specifically with children um, that I can refer you to and we'd be happy to do so. I thank you for your time and I look forward to your call. Take care. Bye.